Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Lovely to see so many of you on this gorgeous, sunny day. Um, I also think we've got one or two men. I'd love to see more men. If you come back to our events on another occasion, please bring a man. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you get any feedback from anyone about why they haven't come to events if they're a man, I'd love to know, because we really think this conversation is about gender. It's about men and women. And we'd like to see more male bums on seats. So those men who are here, thank you so much for coming. You're very welcome. We're very glad to have you. So um, I'm Rosie Campbell. I'm the director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership here at King's College London. Um, before we get cracking, I'm, as usual, got a bit of housekeeping to do. If the fire alarm should go off, it is not a practice. It is, it is genuine. Please follow our designated fire marshals who will be dressed in fetching high-vis jackets and exit down the stairs to floor zero where the assembly point is through the gates in Montreal Place. I'm sure that won't happen. I'm very happy to welcome you here today to discuss the future of work for women in partnership with HSBC and the CBI, two fantastic organisations who've really put their energy behind this. The coming decades will see workplaces change dramatically, with the rise in automation and artificial intelligence making some jobs obsolete and significantly altering others. But these changes will provide opportunities too, and today we want to look at what these changes mean for women in particular, and whether they could actually provide opportunities to improve gender parity in the workplace. So I'm delighted to welcome our three speakers, all of whom will be sharing their own perspectives on what the future could hold, and a little bit of reflection on the past too, I believe. Um, the first remarks will come from Birgit, the Global Head of Diversity at HSBC, followed by Ray Newton-Smith, Chief Economist at the CBI, and then finally Ashwin Kumar, Professor of Social Policy at Manchester University. Following their, their short presentations, we'll have a little bit of conversation between the pan panellists, and then we'll open the floor to questions, and then, of course, you're all very welcome to get a drink, and I hope and believe that we'll be able to take it out onto that glorious terrace. So, let's start. No more ado. So would you mind starting? Excellent, to yes. So my name is Birgit New. I am the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at HSBC. Um, and the future of work is something um, that has been um, of great interest to me since my own university days, mostly out of necessity in the first instance. So in my first term as a business major in New York City, the stock market crashed, um, taking some of my career expectations along with it. Um, and whatever I thought that I was going to do professionally by the time I got out, um, I hadn't really anticipated a few things that were not really commercially available yet, like, oh, the internet, mobile phones, um, all those kinds of things that had a huge impact on my career later on. So I've got um, many personal stories about upscaling and rescaling that I will come back to. Um, but first of all, I think you know, there's a lot of material out there around the topic of the future of work in inverted commas. Um, so there's everything from books like The Fourth Industrial Revolution, um, The Hundred Year Life, lots of research too, great stuff from the World Economic Forum um, on the future of jobs, um, and more and more research also looking at what's going to happen with the diversity lens on. So there's a great new piece from Accenture about uh, inclusive future of work, um, McKinsey actually just put out something, too, on the future of uh, women at work. Um, no shortage of material there. At HSBC, we're also thinking about that, too. So we uh, took a look at something called the Human Advantage last year, where we wanted to see what the impact um, was going to be on banking roles. Um, we've done a few pieces like that over the past couple of years as well, and, and looking at um, particularly, again, what that diversity lens is going to bring. Um, so I'm just going to do a high-level summary, because I'm sure that my colleagues here on the podium are going to go into more of the data and the details. But I think when we look at all this research and what we see out there so far, what is this all telling us? Well, we're seeing that we're still contending with gender stereotypes by occupation, very much. Uh, women are continuing to take the bigger role in family care, which impacts things like mobility choices as well. And whilst it does look like men and women will be replaced by automation more or less equally, at least over the coming decade, the technological disruption from automation is going to hit those roles that include more routine tasks um, and also that require a primary or secondary education. And so who's more likely to be in those kinds of roles today? We do see that as being women. And there are increasing pressures on, um, on how people are making career choices or not making career choices, as the case may be. So we're still seeing some very significant skills gaps growing, um, unequal access to learning, 
for the skills that we're going to need in the future, um, unequal access to the internet between men and women um, to access uh, those uh, learning opportunities, less job security, less financial security, and that kind of context is not one which leads people to want to take more risks with their careers. Um, and those issues may be more pronounced um, not only for women but for other underrepresented groups as well um, and people who are underrepresented already now. So the disruption that we think is going to happen has the potential to make our existing diversity challenges look like a bit of a walk in the park if we're not careful um, and think about more to do to start to address them. So um, just to give a little bit of HSBC context, um, we employ about a quarter of a million people worldwide, uh, 66 countries and territories. We've been around um, for over 150 years, so we know a little bit something about having to change for the future. Um, about two years ago, we launched um, an internal HSBC university, uh, redid all of our learning for leaders, managers, and individuals, again, with more of that future focus already in mind. Um, that uh, site gets about 50,000 visits per month as people are um, starting to work that through. And while some of the elements of the future of work are a much longer way away, um, a lot of that is already going on now in the marketplace. So we're conscious that we need to focus on the skill building for people for what they need right now, as well as what's next, and then preparing them for the future. Um, and for some roles, that kind of now next future trajectory might be 24, 36 months. For other roles, that might still be you know, a decade or more away. Um, the issue is that we don't have all the answers. We don't have the timelines. We don't know exactly how long it's going to take for that to hit. So we need to make sure that men and women are building the skills that mean that they can more easily learn and adapt and change and evolve um, as things change externally. Um, also very importantly for us is making sure that leaders are prepared so that they're able to set the context for their teams um, to be able to do that effectively. And we think that that diversity lens really needs to be applied now. And whilst we know that some of the representation challenges that we faced um, over the past 20 years ago are still not um, fully addressed right now, and that needs to keep going, if we continue working with old solutions uh, without recognizing that we have new problems, then we're going to turn around in the next 20 years' time and realize that you know, algorithms are already embedded by that point, and it's going to be far too late to drive change. So if we look at the kind of future context, if you can hopefully see that in the back, um, down the left, and what we're going to need in terms of skills on the right-hand side, um, a lot of these skills aren't new, but in the corporate space, the focus on teaching these to colleagues and also starting to address these to support employability within our community engagement is different because it's now very clear that we're going to have to uh, be having people upskill or reskill at a very new pace um, than what we were doing before. And it's not only going to be about what we're doing for work and the skills that we're building, um, but also how uh, women and men are working. And uh, we know from the employee surveys that we do, we ask people to identify if they're working some form of formal or informal flex. Um, and what we hear on a global basis is that about 50% of our colleagues are already working some form of flexible uh, schedule or working remotely. Um, this can be a great enabler for gender balance, um, but this is also still quite new, so we're keeping a very close eye on um, what the impact of that is, just to make sure there aren't any unintended consequences um, that play through um, that are negative um, and impact that the wrong way. So we also know that we still have uh, a very big opportunity to take a look at that gender segregation by occupation. Um, so that we don't have those continuing to get in the way of what our ambitions are looking like, so that we do see more men becoming uh, EAs over time, more women going into computer science-related roles um, to break through some of those stereotypes. Um, and very importantly, you know, it's not some sort of faceless them um, that are going to improve the future of work for women or men. Um, education and government policy and large multinationals like HSBC do have a significant role to play, um, but it's also every single one of us, um, all of you in this room, um, that really need to step up to do it for ourselves and also make sure that we're helping the people around us. So um, over 20 years ago, I left a team and a very traditionally female job that I loved but paid very little in book publishing. 
Um, and I begged my way into a much higher paying role in a web design agency down the road. Um, at the time, none of my friends actually knew what a website was as of yet. Um, I didn't know anything about technology either, so um, it was a risky move. Um, it was also a time in my career when I didn't have any kind of financial safety net, uh, but I was actually more scared um, and more concerned about the risk of being left behind if I didn't get into that thing, whatever it was now, and find out more about it. Um, I think it was you know, a really, really tough transition. Those kinds of transitions into new areas um, might not be easy. It was a huge learning curve, um, but it also helped me recognize that having done it once, that I could do it again, um, and also that that was gonna become a key skill and that kind of adaptability and picking up those new skills as you go through. Um, and I also managed to get further in my career than I think I thought I imagined at that point in time. So um, the kinds of conversations that we're having now, particularly with diverse talent um, and with folks in our employee networks um, around um, these kind of future of work and, and future skills um, on personal actions that you can take are things like, you know, think creatively around what you're going to do to build your future, your career path, um, is probably much less likely now to be going in a straight line than it ever was before. So you need to be open to more of the possibilities right from the get-go. Um, you also want to make sure that you're talking to colleagues, uh, teachers, whoever's around you about what's next for the area that you are working in or want to work in. Again, understand where the occupation um, that you're in might be disrupted. Um, so you have a chance to actually try and uh, disrupt yourself, as I think there's quite a few books by that title. Um, before um, that disruption happens to you. Um, you do want to keep on learning new skills in whatever form you can um, and take advantage of all the online learning solutions that are there now. I mean, we've certainly seen that in the corporate space. A lot of that has moved from classroom learning to online to make sure that it's much more time effective, cost effective for people um, and enables them to learn um, around their other commitments at home. Um, Another point that I would also ask you to think about is to challenge yourselves around the development decisions that you're making, and are you falling into what might sometimes be the relative comfort of some of those gender stereotyped occupational tracks? Or as a woman, for instance, um, are you aiming for those tech areas where um, you know, the skills are in much higher demand, um, but those areas might not be full of other women just yet? Um, Another thing is to be clear on your mobility appetite um, and the expectations, which means that you're having the kinds of conversations with family and friends um, about what you're willing to do, what you're able to say yes to from a career perspective um, if those great future opportunities come along, um, learning opportunities or work opportunities, um, because we also see that um, people aren't having those kind of scenario planning conversations and they get surprised and are unable to react as quickly um, or with positive outcomes. I think connectivity also remains a really important um, factor, especially to help mitigate some of the risks um, that you might find, again, um, around these career choices and some of the challenges going forward, um, and making sure that you're getting introduced to people who are working in some of the areas that you're thinking about. If you want to look at upscaling before you make that commitment of getting into something else that you have the chance to find out a little bit and a sort of try before you buy, um, before you spend time um, building that kind of skill to see if that's a direction that you want to go or not. Um, and finally, also really importantly, to think about your transferable skills. Um, I think you know, that's something that for me personally has been super, super important is to know that as you're moving and picking up new skills and looking at new opportunities as, as work shifts, um, that you know what you're good at, you're communicating that to other people around you so that they can also help you find suitable opportunities for interesting and new combinations of skills um, maybe that are less traditional than they were before. Um, and whilst we are here today with a focus on women, um, as a head of diversity and inclusion, my one ask is that we also think beyond one strand of diversity at a time when we're looking at solutions, because many of these future of work challenges are going to apply to lots of other groups too. Um, so make sure that you're not only talking to other women about this, but if you're talking to BAME networks or LGBT networks or disability networks, um, that you're all joining up in this kind of conversation, working with volunteering teams, sustainability teams, um, to look at what we can do around community outreach and partnerships around this too, 
to make sure that people are prepared. Um, if you are jumping on a course or doing something new yourself, then make sure you bring a friend who's also from a different background. I think if we try and approach some of the issues that we're facing now more inclusively from the get-go, we'll get to a much better outcome. And I'll leave it there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Excellent. So um, it's, it's great to, to be here, um, and particularly being uh, at, at King's. I'm a visiting fellow at, at King's, and I think this is um, so gives a nice kind of added dimension and, and nice to see many familiar faces as well uh, in, in the audience. Um, so I thought what, what could be helpful is uh, maybe give a little bit of a historical perspective around, um, uh, you know, are we really seeing this sort of fourth industrial revolution? What, what can we learn from previous ones about what's happened to, uh, to women? And then uh, talk a bit, you know, obviously in, in my role as chief economist at the CBI, I spend a lot of time talking to kind of business leaders and, and really see how they're seeing this wave of technology and what, what does it mean uh, for women, but, but the wider inclusion uh, agenda. Um, that's generally more cheery at the moment, to be honest, than, than uh, the other bit of my job, which is definitely uh, talking to political leaders, which I'm not going to lie, is pretty challenging uh, at the moment. Uh, maybe enough said on that. Um, but I also want to bring out some of the, I think, some of the best practice examples that, that we've kind of come across, I think, within business, uh, where some businesses are really trying to lead the charge, I think, in, in creating a more uh, inclusive society. Um, so I will also, this is going to make, put a bit of a window on a, a what, what it's like in my household. So in, in the Newton Smith Goodwin household, I have to say, my husband and I were debating after the cricket um, uh, and after the tennis as to whether we were in a third or fourth industrial uh, revolution. And we came, uh, we came to opposite conclusions, but, but there we go. Um, but I think one of the things we can, whether this is a third or fourth industrial revolution, I think we can see that there is the pace of technological change um, has picked up. And I think it's interesting when you look in the past about how those technological revolutions they really have transformed the world uh, of women at work. And I mean, and whether you think about the first revolution and, you know, which really started in, in, in England and in the north of England and, you know, how that really led to women working in factories and really making that transition into uh, the world of work. Um, it really was transformative. And I guess, you know, the other big uh, revolution, I think, for women in the world of work was what happened after the First and the Second World War. Um, and I think, you know, that really did change the role of women at work. And this is really brought home to me. I started my career uh, at the Bank of England um, uh, at the beginning of uh, the 21st century. And, and I think what's amazing there is uh, when you look at the kind of history of women in the bank, it was only after the Second World War uh, that women were allowed to wear trousers. Um, and this is like one of the, my grandmother was always obsessed with this. And I think it shows where, um, you know, when she was sort of talking to me when I was entering her career and she's at, at the, you know, coming towards the end of her life, I think because when she was entering the workforce, whether women wore trousers or not was a big liberation. And, um, and I, I suppose I say that partly to remind us of, actually, that's only 70 years ago, is just how much the world of work has changed. And at the Bank of England at that time, it was only after the Second World War that you didn't have to give up your job when you got married. So basically, being, you know, working at the bank was for uh, you know, young married women, um, uh, you're, you're young single women, and, and that once you were married, you were supposed to uh, go to your rightful place uh, at home. And I think we do sometimes have to remind ourselves how much things have changed uh, since then. Um, and uh, obviously, as, as the daughter of, of kind of hippie Canadian parents, I also have to, I think, put in the change that we saw over the course of the 60s as well, and actually the technological change in terms of control over contraception and the decisions over when and whether and how many children to have, I think, is so fundamental to, to women in work, both here but also around developing countries around the world. And, um, and I guess it's also why I think in this sort of balance, I do think, what, particularly for economists, you fall into, are you an optimist about technology or are you a pessimist? And I think for me, I'm definitely an optimist in terms of how this wave of technology is transforming work and also um, how it will transform the world of women uh, in work. Um, and that's partly borne out, I think, as well, when you reflect now about um, how, how working life has also changed over the century. If you go back, you know, over 100 years, you know, in 1865, average hours were 60 hours per week. That's average hours for, for people. Um, and there were no washing machines, no dishwashers. Um, so, 
you know, in that in that environment, there was only it was only possible for one person uh, to really be in the world of work, um, and I think you know that really has changed things to where we are now. So average hours now are much more, uh, are much closer to 32 hours uh, per week, and and that is a huge transformation. Um, and I think that means that actually the world of work is more balanced uh, for everyone. Um, and I think, oh, and of course, part of that transformation has been driven by, by women working part time, uh, but also men. And I think for me, over the course of my career, I've worked three days a week, I've worked four days a week, I've worked three and a half days a week, I've worked four and a half days a week. Um, and now I, I do work five days a week, but with a lot of, of flexibility. Um, and I think there's no doubt in my mind that that's helped my own career. But when I look across at, at my team, one of the things that I'm really pleased about is I have people working, both men and women, working two days a week, four days a week. Um, and also, like I do, you know, using working from home as well. And it is technology that's uh, enabled, I think, uh, some of those people to, to have more choices, uh, which I think is, is what we want. Um, so I think, I think that technology has really enabled some of that change. And I think when you look at where the, the UK is on its sort of journey of, of technological adoption, I think we do have a lot uh, further to run. Um, it's interesting when you look, and you know, I think this wave of technology is about automation, it's about artificial intelligence, it's about connected uh, devices. Um, but actually, the UK, when you look at our manufacturing sector, we have much fewer robots um, per 10,000 jobs. So there's only about 85 robots uh, in the UK. Whereas if you look at Germany or South Korea, uh, they have far more robots. So it, you can also look across countries to see how that transformation uh, will happen. Um, and I think you know what's, what's interesting uh, within that is I think some of the examples that of because I think the, we can sort of fall into the trap of thinking actually that automation means uh, there'll be fewer jobs on average. But actually, I think it's more that it's transforming. And uh, Bridget, you talked about this, the skills that we need within jobs. It's, it's getting rid of certain tasks. But overall, uh, you know, it's going to be increased. You know, it, it will increase the overall uh, number of jobs. But what we have to make sure is that it's easy for people to move between the jobs um, that you know to jobs that are being created, and that's where we really need to have the I think the focus on um, on skills, um, and I think that's one of the things, particularly at the CBI, we've been trying to think about is as we look through this wave of, of technology, we're all living longer, we're all working longer, and so this model that we have at the moment of of kind of investing in our education and our training very much at the beginning of our career, I think absolutely needs to change as with this sort of wave of of technology. Um, and so I think we need to think about how we help people to, to retrain. And there's a role for business in that, but I think there's also a role uh, for government. And we can maybe come on to discuss in, within the panel, you know, how big is that training need and, and who ultimately pays for some of those uh, training needs. But, it, but it's clearly going to take uh, investment uh, from both sides. Um, and, and I think that's really important to bear in mind because one of the things I think that is true when you look over the past uh, decade or so is actually the distribution of the returns to high skilled versus low skilled has has widened, and so that makes it even more imperative that you make it easy for people to learn skills and to learn new skills throughout their lives, so that people aren't getting, you know, trapped in in careers where they don't have as many uh, prospects. Um, uh, to, to, you know, to reach sort of higher living standards. Um, so I think that's really, uh, really, really important. Um, and so whether it's around reskilling, and, and also I think for me that reskilling is also an opportunity to think about women in the workplace uh, and the challenges, you know, we know we have a large gender pay gap. There's still so much we need to do uh, around that. And I think um, there's a huge prize around that, and uh, the, the team at the CBI have, uh, have been working on, uh, on a report called Mind the Gap, which is basically a kind of toolkit, I guess, looking at some of the best practice amongst businesses out there that are really trying to help get, um, help to close that, that gender pay gap. And, and I'm sure everyone sort of knows the stats. If we could close that, it would be a huge boost uh, to growth here in the UK, but also around the world. And I think Christine Lagarde, who is one of my superheroes, uh, has been brilliant at sort of explaining what that means uh, for the world economy. But, you know, we could get on in the UK here, we could get almost a million people 
more women into work uh, if we could really address that. And it, it often starts with real leadership within those businesses. Um, we know it would help to address some of the skill shortages we see in the UK uh, economy. But it, it, you know, people want to work in a more inclusive environment, and, and the data certainly uh, bears that out. So I think I probably just finish with a few uh, of the sort of examples, I think, of companies that have put into place some innovative policies. So whether it's EDF, who are a big you know, en energy and electricity uh, supplier, and as you can imagine, very traditional work workforce. Um, and so you know, they've created big ambitions to get, and this shows you where they are on their change journey, um, but to get 35% of their workforce to be female by 2030 at all levels. Um, and they've really tried to, to reach that. They've totally overhauled their entire recruitment. So they, they've looked at you know, their recruitment brochure, what kind of images are they putting out, what language are they talking about when they're talking about roles in their business. And even when it came to selection centers, putting more women, because obviously they don't have many women applying for those jobs originally. And if you're only one or two uh, of a voice in a room, it can be very isolating. So actually trying to group the women into, uh, so there's more balanced uh, selection centers. And actually that changed the dynamics uh, of some of those recruitment processes. So really, kind of doing a, a full overhaul from, from start to finish. And, and that's really paid dividends uh, for them. Um, another really good example is, is Zurich. So, and actually, the financial services are one of those businesses that where artificial intelligence is, it will really, and is already starting to transform that business because, you know, again, it's those sort of routine tasks um, that are the ones that will be uh, replaced by automation. Um, and that provides more of a role for creativity, for emotional in intelligence, for lots of other skills. Um, uh, but they're certainly at the forefront of that kind of disruption. And what they sort of noticed within their workforce is that uh, people who were working part-time were not as progressing as fast as some of their full-time employees. Um, and, at, and at the same time, obviously, they noticed more women were working part-time. So they said, OK, how, how can we address this? How can we make it easier for our, our employees who are working part-time uh, to really progress? And they had a real single-minded focus uh, on progression for people working part-time. And I think you know, that is exactly the sort of solutions uh, we need to see. Um, and, and finally, if you look at, at Vodafone, we, we touched a bit about, I think, and certainly from my perspective, when I look at my friends and uh, you know, people after they've taken career breaks to have children, often what you see is people then, that's a point where people make a transition in their career and they start asking themselves, you know, how much did I enjoy what I was doing before? And, and what, what do I want to do that will fulfill me afterwards? And it, it's such a good opportunity, I think, sometimes for people to make a career transition. But it's also a really scary time, I think, to make a career uh, transition. Um, and I think Vodafone have really focused on, on how can they attract people back uh, to the uh, world of work after you've had a career break, whether that's for looking after children or, or older relatives. And I think that's really, uh, you know, provided results for them uh, as a business. So look, I think for me, I think we are in this technological revolution. I think there are so many things that we can look to help to catap you know, catapult the lives of, of women further. And I think we can actually use the technology in a really positive way uh, to drive the change uh, that we need. Um, you know, and I guess I'm, I certainly hope that in a, in a few years' time, when my, my children are kind of entering, my girls are entering the world of work, that you know, it, it then becomes a much more inclusive conversation. And, and we won't just be worried about uh, what it means for women. Um, it will be how can we make it, you know, how can we make sure that we're all running inclusive businesses that are attractive to everyone? I really hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so what I wanted to, to do was really to, to start off not just by taking a technology lens on, on, on this question. Um, it is entirely possible that we're going to look back at the labour market in 50 years' time and identify artificial intelligence potentially as a game changer. But the kind of game change that are often talked about in some of the more apocalyptic writing on the future of work actually takes quite a long time. You know, the invention of the railway happened in the 19th century, but the formation of super conurbations um, happened many, 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 many decades later. And so I want to kind of think about some of what's happening in the labour market right now and what is likely to continue over the, over the foreseeable future. And there's three things that I want to sort of pick up on. 
And the first is legal and technological innovation that is affecting how we work. Um, the second is industrial change and the fact that we're going to be losing some jobs and gaining new jobs. And then lastly, a little bit about changing market power. So thinking, so what's the context for kind of recent history? And for me, you know, my principal interest in some of these issues starts with poverty and in work poverty. And 20 years ago, our, kind of one of our principal social problems was thought to be unemployment and worklessness. And when the Labour administration came to government in 1997, um, it introduced the New Deals. The focus of its policy was around getting people into work. And I worked at the Department for Work and Pensions, or the DSS, and then the Department for Work and Pensions at the time. And you know, internally within the department, the belief was that as long as you got people out of worklessness and into any work, actually that would start a positive trajectory for them for the rest of their kind of working lives. It would improve their career. And actually, there was a huge amount of success at the time. You know, long-term unemployment, youth unemployment were absolutely slashed. The UK had very significant increases in the lone parent employment rate at the time. Except that what didn't happen was that sort of ongoing career trajectory. Instead, what we've had is 20 years of increasing in-work poverty. And... Um, when we think about kind of basically the labour market is not providing enough for too many people to earn to, 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 to provide for their families. So let's think about low pay. And looking at low pay, it's really clear that low pay is predominantly female. It's predominantly women. If you look at low pay up to about the late 20s, it's fairly gender balanced. But once you get beyond the late 20s, it's, it's about 70% women, um, typically working part time with children or other caring responsibilities. So if we care about poverty, we have to care about the earnings of low-paid women, and particularly low-paid women working part-time. So that, let me come on to sort of what I see as some of the kind of big questions that we're facing in the world of work. And legal and technological innovation, I'm going to start with legal innovation. Um, we have a Contracts of Employment Act. If you, if you go to work as an employee, I think it's six weeks, I forget the precise period, but you have to be get, given a written statement of the time that you're supposed to work, the pay that you're supposed to get, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a piece of legislation that, that almost none of us engage with on a day-to-day -day basis because it, virtually every employer gives, gives their employees a contract of work. Except, of course, what we've had in recent years partly aided by technological change, is legal innovation that has basically enabled employers to innovate their way around that. That could be zero-hour contracts. Those are now looking a bit more unpopular, so we're getting four-hour contracts. And the majority of the work is, is not covered by a contract of employment. We get fake self-employment. We get forms of legal contract which are designed to avoid some of the protections that we have had for many years. And the, the point about this is that, um, that many of those protections evolved after the Industrial Revolution that we saw in the 19th century. There was political protest that happened in the early part of the 20th century. And a lot of them were cemented kind of in the, second, in the early part of the second half of the 20th century. We're actually seeing quite a lot of these being undermined now by this legal innovation. And it has a relationship. It has an effect on the whole market. I was talking, um, in my previous job, I was a chief economist at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. I was talking to um, a small manufacturing firm, 250 to 300 employers in the Yorkshire region. And it, the, the, the guy who owned the company talked about his belief that he just didn't want to do zero-hour contracts. But also, it was a health and safety risk because there were kind of difficult uh, chemical processes in his manufacturing. But his principal problem was that his market competition all used them. And so when we talk about the kind of the legal innovation that's going on, the Deliveroo's, the Ubers, that actually has an impact on the market overall, and particularly on the prospects of people working, uh, working on low pay. I mean, technological innovation, um, the idea that, that companies now have the ability to do predictive analytics, to be able to predict precisely the hours that people are going to provide the most return for them and only employ them for those hours, changes very much the nature of the employment contract. Um, whereas before, the risk of a downturn, people not turning up to the shop, was a risk borne by the employer, Effectively, in this kind of contract, it's a risk borne by the member of staff. And going back to the point, you know, many of the staff in question are low-paid women working part-time. 
So going on to industrial change, the UK has some of the fastest growth in online shopping in, in the world. I'm sure we all do it. It's um, dead convenient. Um, but a few years ago, the British Retail Consortium estimated that we would lose 900,000 jobs in retail over the following decade. And actually, that wasn't the gross loss. That was the net loss. Whilst there were going to be um, a greater number of jobs lost in the typic typically the frontline jobs in retail, there were going to be jobs created in the back office during the IT, uh, in the IT departments, servicing the greater volume of online shopping. Now, industrial change has always happened. Industrial change due to technology um, has always happened. And the question isn't stopping it. Normally, it creates jobs. But the question is how we manage the displacement that takes place. And of course, what is our plan from the point of view of learning and skills and helping people navigate that displacement for women working part time in their 30s with kids or in their 40s or in their 50s? You look at the entirety of the discussion on skills, and it seems to be utterly dominated by apprenticeships. Now, I am absolutely not saying that apprenticeships are a bad thing, but, but actually, you know, there is a sort of informal view that um, you know, you're talking about people who might well be second earners in a couple, for instance. Uh, the job is less important to that family. Do we have to bother? Um, there isn't actually a plan um, to help people in an industry like retail retrain for the new jobs that are being created. And I think that's one aspect of industrial change, which is inevitably going to happen. We see stories about the decline of retail in terms of the numbers of people working virtually every week in terms of new retailers shutting and, um, or going into administration. And, and yet that is a challenge that we have to face, which is that most people who are going to be in the workforce in 20 years' time are already in the workforce today. So what is our plan, particularly for people on low pay? I just want to say a little bit about changing market power. You can take this in a, in a macroeconomic way and think about the argument that, particularly at the stage of technological innovation that we are in at the moment with uh, data analytics, the potential for artificial intelligence, that this is really highly specialized. And it demands a lot of capital investment in order to be able to develop the use of those kind of technologies. So arguably, highly intensive technology, highly capital intensive technology, increases the market power of bigger firms because of the capital intensity of the technological change. Maybe that will change in a few decades' time as we get more mass penetration of some of these technologies. But that's not actually what I want to talk about. I want to talk about market power in, a, in what might feel a much more prosaic way which is about the public infrastructure that supports the work of low-paid women, which has been degrading over, certainly over the last decade. Between 2005 and 17, childcare costs rose in, in, um, in real terms by 60%, while, while pay ba barely rose at all over that period. Outside of London, local bus services are under severe pressure and ridership is falling. In many, in many areas, adult social care has been stripped to the bare minimum. And so just, just to sort of slightly step back from the narrative and just throw a few facts at you, the IFS's work, the Institute for Fiscal Studies' work on the motherhood pay penalty, shows that by the f time a first child is grown up, mothers earn 30% less than fathers. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation work on the lone parent pay penalty has shown that the gap between lone parent median pay and the median pay of the higher earner in couples has gone up um, over 15 years from £3.59 an hour to £5.86 an hour. The IFS has found that, um, that there is a 5% difference in commuting times between men and women without children, and within a few years of the birth of the first child, it rises to 25%, the difference in commuting time. 50% of workers feel their skills, 50% uh, of low paid workers in retail feel their schools, skills are underutilized. Without a degree, there's virtually no return on skills for part time workers. There's very little difference in the pay rates for people with A levels compared to people with GCSEs, for instance. So, what this is all about is about the bargaining power of people who are facing, of women in particular, in general, who are facing. Um, a whole set of public services which are not providing the infrastructure to support, to support work to the degree that it should do. 
Now, thinking about the determinants of pay, productivity sets the ceiling on what you can be paid. Nobody can be paid more than they produce for their employer. But bargaining sets, sets how far below that ceiling you go. And having a binding constraint of having to get back to the school gate at 3.15 doesn't just reduce the hours that you can work, but it also reduces your bargaining power because it reduces the pool of employers who will employ you. It reduces the pool of jobs that you can get. And so does terrible transport. Um, big retailers tend to pride themselves on the fact that they offer shifts which are flexible around childcare requirements. And for their frontline jobs, that's genuinely the case. But frequently, for a lot of retailers, um, supervisor positions require Saturday shifts. So actually, that bargaining position, the constraint on the pool of jobs that you can get, doesn't just limit the hours that you can work, but it limits your potential hourly rate because of the pool of, uh, the pool of jobs that you can go to and your progression potential. So we, we fail to keep up with the pace, just to finish off, we fail to keep up with the pace of legal and technological innovation about the way that we work. And so we've created a situation where, for a lot of people on low pay, working conditions are just intolerable. And I'm sure that most people in this room would not accept those kind of working conditions. And we are all very pleased by the legal protections that stop that happening in most of our workplaces. But we still have to get back to making sure those protections apply to everybody. Our non-intervention in supporting the careers and working lives of low-paid women working part-time, particularly once they are sort of beyond their 20s, um, means that we've got no plan whatsoever for handling the displacement of low-paid jobs due to industrial change. And the wastage of economic potential that, 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 that is implied by the motherhood pay penalty should obviously be a national economic priority. And then finally, a range of public services that underpin um, the work of low-paid women have withered, and that reduces bargaining power and makes it even harder for low-paid women with caring responsibilities to use the skills that they already have. So until the, the real life of low-paid work and the real life of juggling care and work becomes an economic issue, not just a social policy issue, I worry that we're going to see more of the same. Thank you so much. Depressing but incredibly informative. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you. Um, so I have a bit of discussion between ourselves before we open up to the audience. Um, I first wanted to ask you, Bridget, about um, you talked about in your own personal history how the fear of being left behind motivated you to make a change. And when we were talking beforehand, you were talking about your concerns about complacency that many of us have about our careers continuing in the same vein as they have until now. Do you have any ideas about how you might, we, we might be able to induce more of a fear of being left behind amongst ourselves and amongst each other? Um, I think there's a little bit about you know, forcing the issue, which I think mm -hmm. we need to get to. I mean, we, you know, we're having lots of discussions about this in the workplace, but we're not necessarily seeing people sort of taking up the opportunities at the rate that we might have expected, given how much discussion there is, you know, not only in the office, but outside the office around what's going to happen. Um, so, you know, I think if I use an example going back uh, very early on, um, when I was in year seven, I entered a new school and uh, we had the first day of band practice and all the girls played the flute and all the boys played the trumpet. And the, uh, the band leader said, you know, only the top two would get to play, um, and everybody else had to pick something new, and I, and, or you would be in the band, you know. And so I learned how to play French horn, which I never expected. But, you know, I, I think it's almost something like that of actually saying to people, look, you know, we have to create some scenarios of going, you're going to need to rescale. If you had to, if your job went today, what would you do? So I think there are more discussions around just also exposing people to, okay, so if you're not going to be able to do what you're doing today, what are the other options out there? And having those discussions and giving more visibility to what those things are, because I think there is that, oh, future of work, AI, technology, those things are over there. They're not for me. I don't really know what it means. So I think kind of giving that visibility to what, what does that job mean? What, if I was going to rescale, what would it take? How long would it take me? I think just communicating a lot more about that is going to be the key to get people to step up because right now there's still that kind of safety of going, I'm going to carry on until somebody tells me to stop what I'm doing now. So there's perhaps a moral imperative on employers to disrupt this a little bit. I think so. I think we definitely have a role to play in, in pushing that a little bit further and making sure that we stay ahead. Rain, you were talking about the need for education throughout the life cycle. Um, 
as somebody who works in university with two youngish children, I see the threat of the expense, you know, ahead of me. Um, and uh, I wonder, as the CBI, do you have a position on, on how this education can be funded and sustained throughout a life cycle? Because, in fact, a lot of the resources yeah. that you were describing, adult education centres, etc., a lot of them are being closed down. How, how, how are we going to get people access to this training that they need? Well, I think... I mean, I think, to be honest, it's like we're just at the beginning of, of having that debate and, and figuring out how, and I think policy does need to uh, catch up. I mean, you, we've, we've seen some progress, but it's still sort of piecemeal. So there is, uh, this government has something called the National Retraining Partnership, um, you know, which is a partnership between the CBI and, and the TUC um, to help at, with adult retraining, but but at the moment the the, the funding into it is 100 million pounds. So if you divide that by the number of people, it, it's it's about 10 pounds per head, which I think everyone acknowledges is not going to be adequate for what we need over the future. Um, so I think there is something about. Um, it's going to take investment by businesses. I mean, businesses obviously do already invest a, a lot in retraining, um, but it needs to be portable. And there's always going to be, you know, as an individual business, you don't reap all the benefits from, um, you know, the training you invest in, in, in people. So I think it has to be, you know, over the longer term, looking at some sort of model, uh, you know, in, and it's been tried in the past, and we need to learn some of the... Uh, some of the reasons why it didn't work before, but you know, sort of individual learning accounts. Can you have something where both the government uh, and individuals and businesses can sort of pay into it, where people can uh, access training, which is more uh, transportable? I think the other element is really thinking about how we how we train digital skills from an early age and making sure that our our education, you know, even the the bit from a very early age is focused on the right sort of skills that we'll need and. In the future, that's always really hard to uh, predict, but clearly having more of a like, digital skills passport rather than just a focus on reading and numeracy uh, at a very early age uh, is going to be uh, really important. Um, and I think, you know, I guess some of the things that Ashwin was talking about, I think, look, thinking about how, you know, what kind of provision we have uh, for childcare. And, and I mean, everyone recognized, you know, over the past decade, childcare costs. Uh, have gone up, but I guess it's partly thinking how how can we make the world of work more flexible so that it isn't it isn't only you know the the burden of some of those and I, I'm, it's not a burden. I love, <laughs> I have four kids. I love them dearly, and and spending time with them is not uh, only a burden, but but just that it's a kind of shared parental you know shared parental leave, shared uh, maternity and paternity leave are really important, and the more it's a sort of shared. Uh, responsibility, I, I think, is really important, and and I think you know that, and I think also thinking about the retail sector is is vital. But I think one of the things that has been a real, I think, progress over the past ten years has actually been the move to the national living wage, um, and actually the it's people on on the very lowest pay whose pay has moved a lot faster um, than on average, and and I think that's one. You know, I'm not. You know, there's things that haven't always worked out, but actually that's been a piece of... And, and when you think, you know, the UK has been more ambitious than a lot of countries on that internationally. Um, and I think that has been a real uh, success. Of, of, and we've managed to do that at the same time. You know, we've got one of the lowest unemployment uh, rates, you know, it, yeah. it, historically. So I think that has been a, a real success. But, but I think we do need to think about some of the challenges ahead. You look like you might want to, to reply to some of that. Was that the case? Uh, so I just want to sort of take an angle on training and lifelong learning. You know, when the state has intervened in this area, there's often a sort of suspicion that are they going to make the wrong decisions and just deliver crap stuff that, that's not what industry needs. Mm -hmm. And so then the, the kind of the rhetoric turns to it's got to be business led. And, but I sort of, sorry for being an economist about this, but I just want to go back to the kind of the economic theory of it, which is that... If an employer spends some money on training and some of the value of that, that that's created by that training is going to help the person leave that firm, then the employer's not going to spend as much as is required by the economy, by society. That there is a natural market failure here. Um, and that is not to be critical of an employer, you know, you know and to take, to take the position of, of retailers. Retailers are under pressure. You know, this is an industry which is having to restructure, to reorganize, to survive. It's got to change its form. So the idea that kind of retailers are going to take on for themselves the burden of effectively training their current staff to leave them <laughs> onto the sort of new job 
themselves that are being created is wholly unrealistic. So we have to acknowledge that because of that market failure, there is a role for the state, but it has to be designed in the way that doesn't create a situation where you're sort of centrally planning the wrong sort of training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, and so I think that it's, it's really important to recognize that. The other thing I wanted to just say about that point about the costs of spending money on training and then your staff leave, and therefore you've got a reticence about it. So there's some evidence for low-paid people, for instance, that, that training is concentrated on health and safety and induction training and not really kind of training that's going to help them sort of develop their careers. There's an interesting experiment going on in Liverpool, actually, about the idea, I think it's City and Guilds trying to work with the City Council, about developing a framework, a skills framework for the hospitality industry in Liverpool. I'm not sure how far the project has gone. Maybe I'm speaking too soon and I haven't got that far, but I've certainly had conversations about it. But the point about that is that if you're in accountancy, the big four firms spend a huge amount of money on training and they lose some of those staff. They go and work for other people. But all the staff that they recruit have been, have been trained to exactly the same standard. And so the market failure cost of training is much lower. Whereas when you have an atomized situation where you have, like in hospitality, for instance, lots and lots of small employers, the consequence is that the, that market failure risk of kind of training people and then they just leave is much greater, particularly if you don't have that many kind of promotion opportunities because you're a fairly small business. So actually there is a role, it, it, it's, yes there is money from the market, you know, the state needs to spend money, but also maybe there's a coordination issue, creating kind of industry-wide frameworks, particularly in low paid sectors, so that there is less of this market failure, so that people can get trained and that employers get the benefit, kind of the network effects, the kind of collective benefit of having common frameworks might make it easier for low-paid people, for employers actually to train people on low pay. Um, did you want to come back on that, or shall I ask another? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you'll like this question, especially given your earlier comment about not wanting to talk about politics too much, but we are about to have a new Prime Minister, and uh, should you be given the opportunity to go to number 10 and pitch for something that will help Britain respond to the changing future of work and ensure that women aren't left behind. What would you pitch for? I'll give you a second to think. I'm going to defer to my colleagues. <laughs> Come back after, I'll think what you'd ask for. Open. Um, well, I guess it's some of the things I, I'd sort of already said. I mean, absolutely. One priority. Well, I think digital skills at you know, at, at an early age, and then, and then I think really, and it's picking up what Ashwin is saying, there is, you need, it's, it's picking up on this idea of, of individual learning accounts and really building on that idea, and that's got to be investment by business, but, but also government, because there is, it is absolutely true, as a business, you know, you, you are never going to invest, you know, there will be always a market failure, you cannot invest if that, those skills are transportable and that's what you want. You want people to move from, from jobs. And actually what's interesting about the younger generation is they're actually moving jobs less and that's having an implication for their pay because it's when you tend to move jobs that you get an uplift uh, in pay. So I think, uh, you know, we do want to see that job mobility. We want to make it easy for people to get the skills they need but to move to other companies and into other sectors um, and, and move around the country where they can apply those skills. So I think really having a serious think about the retraining challenges that we have and how business and government work together to deliver that. So as a politician um, from the Conservative Party that's been really challenged by UKIP recently, my mind has really been focused on white men in sort of self-employed, often professions who have been disaffected and perhaps some of them have felt that, they, that they've been left behind in the conversation. How are you going to convince me as the Prime Minister that I really need to be thinking about these low-paid women and that that's going to matter for you and for the economy? Yeah. Uh, so, well, I, I'm not going to get... I, I mean, I'll let... Well, others sort of think... I mean, I think you... Um, you know, they are part, they, they vote as well and they're part of that, that sort of wider, uh, wider dynamic. And I think you, you know, it's also thinking about, you know, what needs to happen uh, over the future. And I think we need, we know that, that there is, you know, there is a challenge about women in, in lower paid uh, professions and how can we make it easier for, for them to, to have more choice, essentially. Um, so I think it's Well, I'm it's convinced. Just about I don't know if the office holder will be. <laughs> Any final comments you want to make before we go to the floor? 
Uh, no, let's go to the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's have some to questions. Let's go to the So I'll take them in batches of three. There's one hand straight up there. Uh, one, two, lady with the black jumper at the back there. Anyone? Any hands at this side of the room? Yes, lady there. Thank you. So we'll take them in three. So. Thank you. Uh, so maybe my question is more on the ethical side of uh, the labor market. So let's presume that most of the jobs and spheres will be possibly occupied by AI agents or whatever it is to come in the future. Do you think that some uh, spheres should not be occupied and should remain human solely? Thank you. Is it working? All right. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I wanted to focus on the sort of education part uh, of the discussion, especially on undergraduate edu education, a uh, question that been, I've been wondering about after graduating and then realising the time I spent for four years is already behind me and now that I'm entering the work market, actually everything's more forward rather than what my sort of education content was. So um, I wanted to concentrate on what needs to exactly change in undergraduate degrees per se, and how would we make that change, considering that you know my sister who graduated 10 years ago, um, her content was similar to mine. Like I didn't learn any sort of digital skills such as coding that I think partially should be basic on a lot of fields already. Um, yeah, how do you see that change being yeah, happening? <laughs> Hi, I'm Maya Tamara, recent grad here and engagement officer at the Entrepreneurship Institute. Um, I wanted to take your um, opinions on technological biases, particularly mm. in the recruitment process. Um, there's been recent claims how algorithms are based on historical databases, which aren't really in favour of women or those from the BAME background. So I wanted to see how far you think it would affect the um, labour market in the future. So three great questions. Yeah. Anyone want to leap on to answering? Um, I'll take a view on the recruitment piece. I mean, I think um, that the awareness of the challenges on that front are, are very, very high, and you see a lot going on already to you know, raise awareness and also look at different uh, technology solutions that are already coming into place to try and mitigate some of the challenges around that. So um, I think I'm, I'm optimistic if I were to say that, you know, are we, are we in time to catch that again before it's deeply ingrained? Um, you know, large employers like the banks are definitely thinking about it. I think there might be more challenges, again, if you're getting into smaller employees, employers that might not be as equipped to be aware of what some of the issues are. Um, but I hope, I hope that there's enough discussion now to step in before it's too late on that particular front. Any other responses? Um, Go on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess one of the, the things on... on um, uh, the recruitment processes. I think one of the things that we do have is the data analytics capability to almost, I, I think you're right, there is a danger. You need to, as with any recruitment thing, you need to look at uh, who's applying and who is not applying and where they are falling off in each sort of stage. And that's one of the things that data analytics should, you know, if you're a big enough company, you, you can see uh, whether the way you are recruiting is bringing in more, more bias, bias. If you're finding that, you know, women are, uh, or, or people from a BAME background aren't making it through the different bits of the hurdles in the recruitment process, then you can look at that particular hurdle and say, well, why isn't that making it easier? Uh, you know, why isn't that a sort of fair um, uh, process? So I think that's one of the, the, the value of having, of data analytics being like relatively cheap now, that at least you can do some of that analysis, which in the past would have been really hard to do. Um, so I think that's been an improvement. Um, I think the question about like the changing, and I, and I feel actually maybe it's probably one, Rosie, we should get you to... to well, I have got a view on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, to, to bring in on it. I mean, I think what I find kind of a, is I think there is a huge opportunity for the way we teach in education to change. But I think it's quite amazing how... And I think it is happening, but it is happening really slowly. And one way I can characterize it, I went to a... Uh, an event in Silicon Valley when, and I was quite excited. I've never been to Silicon Valley, and I'm, I'm going to the home of kind of technology. And and and, and there was a session about ro like robotics and education in, in a high school. And I thought that this was and the way the fourth industrial revolution. And I thought it was going to be about the opportunity 
through how you can bring like teachers into classrooms where they don't always have access to that classroom and really use things like AI and other things to, to transform the world of education. But actually, it was much more you know, uh, 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 basic than that. It was really just looking at robotics in Lego and build, kids building models and, and learning how to code to, to build those models. So in a way, I feel... So that was quite interesting, but it was certainly not the kind of forefront of technological innovation that I was expecting to see. So I think we will see quite a big transformation in, in education over the next um, decade or, or so. Um, and I think the only other thing I'd, I'd sort of add to that is, and this is one, and it's actually some work from, well, there's been work from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, but also uh, the McKinsey Global Institute is looking at the kind of returns to education and the returns to different degrees. And I guess that's one of the things where I think we can kind of arm ourselves with. Um, and, and actually, there's differences there for women and men in terms of what are the returns to different, uh, different degrees. And, and I think that's something where people should look at that before, you know, while you're making your choices and thinking, and that's not to say, obviously, the, as an economist, the private economic return is absolutely not the only thing that matters in an education by no means. But I think being informed by what some of those returns are when you're making, making choices is, is helpful. I do think information is power. The one thing I'd say on algorithms is that I think transparency is a, is a real challenge um, because... Um, a, lot of, a lot of these products are going to be developed in commercially sensitive contexts and they're going to have a market value, so people are going to want to sell them and that's quite reasonable because they put effort into, into developing them. But then, then it becomes much harder to be able to sort of judge the, the effect of these algorithms and I think um, I'm struck uh, actually in some of the debate about Facebook and politics, knowing a little bit as I do about local politics, one of the requirements of kind of old world politics is transparency. You're not allowed to put a leaflet out unless it has an imprint saying um, who, uh, who it was on behalf of, who, who printed it, um, so that there can be accountability for election offences that are committed uh, in the writing of those leaflets. And in fact, one MP was uh, removed from office because of election offences committed in, uh, in his campaign. And I think the, uh, that exposed the kind of notion that we have not, from a sort of a regulatory, commercial, ethical point of view, really thought through the transparency challenges of technology where the capital intensity of the production of these algorithms is so high that actually it's very hard. Um, and so I think there's probably solutions in the political sphere that are a little bit easier, but I kind of, I, 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 you know, I, I think that we've got a lot more thinking to do on this. Does anyone have anything to say on the ethics yeah. question? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think I have a really good answer, but I think it's absolutely the questions that, that, need, to be, that need to be asked. And, and, you know, certainly, I guess I studied philosophy as part of, of my education, and I think it's absolutely, at, you know, that's why it's good. And, I mean, the government does have the sort of centre for uh, ethics in artificial intelligence and data, and I think we need to be asking uh, these questions. I think where... You know, because one of the interesting things around regulation as well is how does regulation keep pace with changing technology? And one good illustration of that is obviously with driverless cars is who is ultimately responsible when accidents happen? And you need to design the regulation really well so it's clear who is accountable um, when accidents happen. And, and, and mm. I think that, yeah. you know, that's one of the areas where we really need to, to think through. And I, I think having you know, people doing some of the deep, deep philosophical thinking on that is, is really important. I've got a, a couple of things to say about the undergraduate education mm -hmm. point. Um, that we know that in the sort of the first era of computers, women were very heavily involved. I don't know if any of you have seen that film, Hidden Figures. Yeah. But because it was some sort of te secretarial, kind of technical, administrative, women were involved. And actually, we've seen a process where women have, have exited or been exited from, mm. from the more prestigious roles in, in computing and IT. But there are ways of drawing women into STEM that have been successful. And my colleague, Laura, who's in this room somewhere, um, wrote a report summarizing the research and what we know. And one of the things is if you want to get women into engineering, for example, if you can sell engineering programs in the way MIT has done in the US, around the potential to transform the world for the better, you can actually get an intake that's 50-50 men and women and retain women throughout. Mm -hmm. So some of this is about 
how we present the material that's going to be taught, and thinking about actually different kinds of men also entered that program. So some of what might make it quite... Um, I don't know what the right word is, a group of like-minded individuals actually to make it more diverse, a more diverse group by actually having a different way that it's sold really made a difference. And my personal view is that in the UK in particular, we narrow down much too quickly before we've been exposed to sufficient different possibilities and opportunities at university. And I would personally like to see the first year or two at university involve a lot more exploration of different ideas, different subjects, rather than narrowing down so quickly. Um, I think that might help a lot, um, but that's my... Well, and I think you know, that's definitely something that we're seeing in terms of corporate learning as well, and also as the kind of traditional job tracks are training, companies are moving away from that kind of prescriptive, here's what you must learn now, and then this is what you're going to learn for the next job, is you know, we're very much trying to turn the responsibility for learning over to the individual to go, you know, this is not a kind of nanny state where we, as your employer, are going to tell you every step of the way. And we're making it a lot more self-serve and open to people to go, you know, be curious. We want you to be creative. Like, look at what you're interested in. So, you know, if you're reading about something and you want to learn about something, we're going to make it available to you. And again, finding, you know, more of those kind of low-cost options that people can dip in and out and try different things and see. So I think you know, that's an important thing, too, of going, you know, don't, don't wait for it to be handed to you. And I certainly think, I mean, you know, it was the same problem in my career. I graduated, and two minutes later, my you know, degree was fairly obsolete because things changed. And I think you know, we all have to get much more, um, I think, you know, up to speed around the fact that we're going to have to control our own destiny around this and understand what we need to learn and, again, not wait for somebody to hand us the answer. Because I don't think... You know, that man, whether it's government or somebody is always going to have the perfect answer for each one of us individually. Well, I think we've got time for a couple more quick questions before we wrap up. I see two hands immediately going up here. Um, any others? Gentlemen at the back. So we'll take those last two questions. Um, hello. Thank you. Um, I work for the Girls Network, which is a mentoring charity for teenage girls. Um, and there's been lots of really useful advice in all the things that you've said, but I wondered if you could kind of distill one piece of advice or something that we can tell our teenage girls, something concrete that they can do. Um, thinking of one girl who, not complained, but said to me, um, all she keeps hearing is, oh, the job that you're going to go on to do doesn't even exist yet. And she just doesn't know what to do with that. So I wondered if you could try and come up with one, one piece of advice that I can pass on to What a great girls. question. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Shanta. Um, I work at YouGov. Um, I wanted to ask about reskilling, uh, particularly women uh, maybe in their 50s or 40s going back into the workplace after taking an extended period uh, of time out of work, uh, particularly for children, um, and particularly women who um, don't necessarily have a degree. Um, very anecdotal, uh, but my mum uh, worked in advertising until her late 20s, took a large period of time to look after me and my brother, um, and now she's a postwoman, um, which is a job that she likes, um, but there's, there's so much untapped potential, I feel, with, and she can't be on her own, um, other women. So I want to know what you think could be the business and or mm. governmental response to um, uh, reskilling, particularly women who have come back into the workplace who don't have a degree. And one last question, the gentleman over here. Yeah. Well, there's quite a lot of suspense behind this now. Um, <laughs> my name's Alex, I work for ICM Unlimited, the social research and public opinion agency. Um, it's been a really interesting conversation, and I think there's been a lot of interesting stuff on the opportunities and threats that are felt probably by both men and women um, with the future changes in work. I think we've had a lot on the threats or challenges that would be felt by women, especially from the fact that disproportionately uh, or are disproportionately currently working in lower paid part-time professions or roles. I guess I'm interested in what the panel think are the key perhaps opportunities, or if they had to pick out kind of one opportunity or positive development that is likely to disproportionately benefit women in the future, changes work. And maybe as a counterpoint to that, and maybe revealing of myself, what, what are the challenges or that men should feel disproportionately in that change as a man? What, where am I going to perhaps be more vulnerable with the changes that we're going to see compared to, compared to women? Yeah. 
Thank you very much indeed. So the last three questions, if anyone wants to jump in. We've got um, girls, what would you say? Mm. Um, um, I'm going to jump in on your question. So um, one of the things that we did at the bank um, already about 10 years ago is we decided that we weren't going to have a women's network. We were going to have a gender balance network because we were very much concerned that a lot of what was going on, again, if, if we get to where we want to be with more shared you know, family responsibilities um, and different ways of working, that actually the same exact things that are negatively impacting women might be negatively impacting men. And we're having so many of those conversations with the men in the room now around going, you know, if I'm working flex or I'm working part time, lo and behold, I'm running into the same issues around, am I getting promoted at the same rate? Or, you know, is, is the issue that I'm not in the office all the time and not in front of my line manager and therefore that's impacting my career path? Um, we're also looking at things like, you know, the number of people with caring responsibilities, right? And that number is starting to go up and up. That's going to present a whole different set of challenges. Again, men and women are in those same positions. Um, we're seeing, uh, last year we looked at um, the sabbatical numbers of, you know, is it men or women taking sabbatical? And again, it was almost even in terms of the number of men and women doing that, but they've been out of the office again for a period of time. They're coming back in. It's harder. So I do think that you know, I'm much more inclined, rather than looking at everything in terms of, you know, developing one solution for women and one solution for men, of looking at, you know, what is the situation, what is the specific challenge, and how do we design the solutions that are going to be better for everybody, and not just looking at it in that very binary way. But I do think, to your point, that many of the same problems are, are going to happen for both sides, but also, at the same time, many of the same opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, happy to, I guess, uh, pick in on, I mean, so the advice to, um, uh, to a teenager, it's a great question. I mean, I think, I guess I would say a, a couple of things is, you know, if you are, I guess it's sort of thinking what you want to do at that stage and, and are you thinking about a degree or apprenticeship? And I would say just, like, make your choices, you know, informed with, with information. So, so I think when you are looking at a, a degree, thinking about... Uh, the sort of returns, and I'll, I'll make a plug. Uh, the return for women in studying economics is one of the highest returning degrees that, that you can get. So, uh, uh, but actually, fewer and fewer women are studying economics, uh, both at A level. But, but I, and A level is not the only pathway into university uh, in studying economics. But actually, it's a big challenge for the future of the economics profession is fewer women are, are studying economics. Um, and I think one of the things we didn't really touch on in this discussion, but I think is really interesting, is we probably do need to have more evaluation of like public policies and what it means for women and, and for men. And actually, that sort of you know gender-based policy is only evaluation is only really uh, starting. So I think you know look look at your uh, choices in terms of degrees, and, and equally as well within apprenticeships and. Ashwin, you raised this, and actually there's been some really interesting research again. So apprenticeships do have a high return uh, if you're a man, and, you, and because they generally pick the high value uh, apprenticeship, so in engineering and those, but actually, you know, obviously there's a lot of route into apprenticeships, which is around child development, and unfortunately, you know, at the moment where we are in society, those aren't really valued in, in terms of the overall uh, return. So I think, you know, kind of going into your career choices, I guess, with your eyes, you know, your eyes wide open uh, would absolutely um, be one of the things I, I, would, I would say. And, um, and be bold as well to sort of take risks because, you know, that, that, that's really important. Um, I think there was a really good question about kind of returners into work and how do we, and we look, we all know that there's kind of untapped potential, I think, in, uh, and you can see it whether people, and when people do return to work, they're uh, you know, economy, we use dreadful phrases like they're, you know, they're underemployed in the sense that they are higher skilled than, than sometimes than the job they're doing. That's, um, so I think thinking how we uh, tap into the, uh, the skills uh, from people who have taken a career break is really important. And look, there was, I gave that example of Vodafone who really had a focus in terms of what, what they were doing within uh, the company. But I think, it, again, it comes back to these more fundamental things as an employer when you're looking, make sure you're, your recruitment process is really inclusive because, 
we now, you know, more innovative employers aren't just sort of saying you must have X degree from Y institution to come and work in our business. They're looking at what skills do I need in a person, what talents do I need in this job, and then trying to have a recruitment process that is based around those skills rather than just looking at, at what people, you know, what it says on, 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 the pa on paper that, that people can do. And I think that is so important, you know, because I will certainly say my team will probably vouch for this. I, uh, you know, I did take maternity leave when I had my uh, kids. I did manage to generally work uh, part time, but I, I will tell you, you learn so much from juggling uh, four kids under the age of five. I am um, generally, I think it's been in the world of work. It takes quite a lot to uh, to get me into a flap, and it's partly because I've learned to firefight. And so I think there are so much skills and talent. Uh, in terms of people who have, and it's not just about children, it's ju juggling care, caring responsibilities. I think they tend to be more resilient in employees, so thinking how we can make it easier for people to make that transition back to work when they're ready is, is really important. Thank you. So a couple, a couple of comments on that one, which is, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic to hear about examples of specific companies which are specifically addressing the issue of people returning to work after a long break. Um, we need to think about what support is out there for people who don't have access to those kind of companies. And, um, and we have to be able to make the kind of the business case for it from a national economic point of view and make this an economic issue. Um, because, you know, I talk, when I kind of said in my concluding comments about the kind of motherhood pay penalty and kind of the, the, the degree of underused potential in terms of the macroeconomy. Now, we can all sit here and say it's an equality issue, it's a rights issue, etc. But actually, it helps to be able to make the business case as well when it comes to national economic policy making. And one aspect of that that I think is worth mentioning, I mean, I did my master's degree in economics part-time. And, um, and actually, the reduction in part-time study that has happened in recent years has been really terrible. Now, part-time study, as it's currently configured, doesn't really help you if you're juggling two jobs and, mm. in shifts and you've got kids to look after. But the broader point is that we need to make sure that there is a, 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 a training and a skills and an education and learning offer that fits with the reality of people's lives. And, and part-time study is one aspect of that. Um, just, I wanted to just come back on the question about kind of opportunities, actually, because I think it's, I was a bit pessimistic, wasn't I, when I made my comments <laughs> oh, earlier. So, so I think there's, and actually I want to come back on um, what you said, Rain, which was this thing about the national living wage. And actually, if, uh, when we get there with the sort of getting to where the national living wage mm. is going to go, we're going to have one of the highest minimum wages in kind of comparable countries. And there used to be a view kind of e in kind of economics that basically people, that if you put the minimum wage up too high, then actually um, companies couldn't afford to employ people and that we just have lots of unemployment. And what, what, what was underlying that was the idea that people have an inherent level of productivity and that if you set the wage above their level of productivity, they're all going to be out of work because nobody can afford to, to pay them because they won't produce enough for the companies. But actually what we've learned from both the voluntary living wage and actually how companies have reacted to the national living wage is that they've had to look for the productivity improvements to, to, to actually meet the higher wage demands and that actually productivity follows, in a sense, the, the regulatory framework that we have. And I think this is, this is an important bit of insight that actually says we can shape what happens in the labour market if we do it in the right way. Um, we can shape it by setting a, a, an ambitious minimum wage, by having better employment standards so we reduce the kind of the effects of, you know, all of those zero hours contracts. What do they do for engagement? Yet all of the management research says that, you know, kind of engagement is good for productivity. So actually the notion that, that is out there that you can kind of drive up standards by kind of regulation and the fact that it was a right of centre government doing that, I think, is, is really positive. And one slight aspect of that is the idea of good employment charters that Manchester are going to be uh, introducing uh, next Monday, actually. Um, Scotland are talking about it, and other places are talking about it. The idea of setting standards for work, and that might actually help us get both from a national economic point of view to a higher productivity place, but also the potential for better work, better pay for people um, at the bottom of the earnings distribution, I think is, a, is, is positive. Well, that's a great place to end, I think. A positive note, we found one. Thank okay. you so much to all our speakers. It was a really informative and engaging event. Thank you so much for your time.
do stay for a drink and something to eat, and I'm hoping that we're allowed to take it out onto the terrace. I'm getting, am I getting nods from anyone in power? I'm getting nods, yes. So please do enjoy a bit of sunshine. Thank you so much.